This is Ham College, Episode 74, for February 28, 2021. This episode of Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. The great outdoors is calling. Get outside and under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate STR transceivers. Good evening and welcome to another action-packed episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And Dean, let I me... I was s- looking at the uh, opening sequence there and uh, they got a couple of young guys on there. We may have to replace those with the old guys that are doing it now. Yeah, those those guys weren't fully accredited, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we've got... An interesting topic lined up tonight. We talked about uh, operating methods, uh, specifically operating HF digital modes, last time around. We're going to talk about uh, electromagnetic waves, unless I'm totally off on this, too. No. Uh, Earth-Moon-Earth communications, meteor scatter, microwave tropospheric and scatter propagation. That's a mouthful. Aurora propagation ionospheric propagation changes over the day, and circular polarization. So, And I've already got a headache just thinking about it. Sounds like there's going to be a lot of propagating going on tonight. It, it does. Well, before we get too far into it, it was in the 80s here today uh, at the end of February. Last week, what, it was this time it was, I don't know, maybe in the 20s? Yeah, if we're lucky. Yeah. And ice, ice all over the place. Yeah, we had some pretty severe ice storms. I should have brought out my ice pictures. Uh, Stan sent me some ice pictures. Uh, yeah, all my transmitter sites got iced up pretty good. You could see the reflected power on the remote controls. And afterwards, and after it had melted and stuff started falling off, you could see the holes in the roof and broken satellite dishes and all kinds of stuff around up under there. Oh, uh, yeah. That's why I try not to go to the transmitter sites when they're iced up. Because uh, yeah. it's eventually coming down. Yeah, it's coming down hard, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this, you know, I've just got 1,000-foot towers now, but back in uh, the 80s and 90s, you know, well, one of my sites had a 2,000-foot tower, and we had a really bad ice storm. That was man-sized ice falling off of that thing. I mean, Ooh. huge, yeah. Hard hat's not going to help you with that. No, not very much. <laughs> well, I think maybe we can get on into the questions tonight. Some of these are just out of this world, Dean. Yeah, you've been you studied up for a while for that one, didn't you? Well, no, it just occurred to me right then. So uh, that being the case, I think I'll ask you the first one. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, I know the answer to that one. Yeah, you looked at the at the answer for that one. What is the approximate maximum separation measured along the surface of the Earth between two? Stu- two stations communicating with EME. Is it A, 500 miles if the moon is in perigee? B, 2,000 miles if the moon is at apogee. C, 5,000 miles if the moon is at perigee. Or D, 12,000 miles if the moon is visible by both stations. 2,000 if the moon is at apogee, which I think that means the farthest away. 5,000. Yeah, Apogee is the farthest away. Perigee is the closest. No, 5,000. 
5,000 miles is only one and a half times across the U.S. And I'm, I'm thinking it's going to probably be... The moon is visible by both stations. That's the kicker, if the moon is visible by both stations. I'm thinking it's probably going to be D... And the reason I'm leaning toward, I don't, I really don't know the answer for sure, but the reason I'm saying that one is because it says if the moon's visible by both stations, which is a key factor. I, I think it's going to be D, but I'm, I really don't know. Uh, I'm that's my, right. I'm that's going, the reason for my guess, anyway. I'm agreeing with you, and most people agreed with you, although there were some C's in there. 12,000 sounds a little bit much, but, you know, if both stations can see the moon, well, uh, that's what well, uh, Yeah, and that's, that's the reason I chose that one. Oh, well, I got lucky on that one. Yeah, I don't know. You you put some ciphering on it. 5,000 5, doesn't seem far enough because, I mean, there's still, if the moon, if the moon were right in the middle... And you would have to be, I think you would be way more than 5,000 miles, obviously, that you could, both stations could see the moon. What characterizes libration fading of an EME signal? A, slow change in the pitch of the CW signal. B, a fluttery irregular fading. C, gradual loss of signal as the sun rises. Or D, the returning echo is several hertz lower in frequency than the transmitted signal. Hmm. What huh. characterizes libration fading of an EME signal? Okay, EME is Earth, Moon, Earth. A slow change in the pitch of a CW signal. Now, I don't think that happens. A fluttery, irregular fading. Hmm, maybe a gradual loss of signal as the sun rises. Yeah, but that's not libration fading. That's just fading. I think I have a hunch about what I think what a, this might be. The, Only just from stuff that I think I remember reading a long time ago. The returning echo is several hertz lower in frequency than the transmitted signal. I don't think it changes the frequencies or anything. I think it's a B, a fluttery, irregular fading. What do you think, Dean? Yeah, that's what I think too. Because I, I remember reading something about that uh, year, years and years and years ago. I got lucky on that one too. But I, I do think I remember hearing that 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 was a characteristic that could happen of of that. Yeah, the moon surface is is not flat or smooth. You know, there's craters and mountains and such on it. So you know, it's not going to give you. A, a good solid reflection that's going to kind of be uh, doing some crazy fading stuff. And, you know, you can't even operate EME unless you got some serious um, directional antennas and about legal limit. When scheduling EME contacts, which of these conditions will generally result in the least path loss? A, when the moon is in perigee. B, when the moon is full. C, when the moon is at apogee. Or D, when the MUF, or maximum usable frequency, is above 30 megahertz. Which, when scheduling EME, which of these following conditions will generally result in the least loss? I, th I think that's going to be A, perigee. When the moon is at perigee, and unless I've got him backwards, I think that means when it's the closest to the Earth. Yeah. Um, but that makes sense to me that the close, closer it is, it's going to be a lot stronger. The moon is at, the moon is full, about yeah. 30 megahertz. I think that's... Yeah, I'm going to agree with you. Right. Everybody in the it chat. It seems rooms. like the, the D might be plausible, but uh, A, I'm pretty sure, is probably going to be the answer. 
Yeah, everybody's saying A, so it is A. Okay, what do Hepburn maps predict? A, sporadic E, propagation. B, locations of auroral reflecting zones. C, likelihood of rain scatter along cold and warm fronts. Or D, probability of tropospheric propagation. What do... A lot of big words on these tonight. What do Hepburn maps predict? Hmm, a Hepburn map. Well, I just happen to know the answer to this one. It's nothing to do with sporadic E or auroral reflections or the likelihood of rain scatter. It's the probability of tropospheric propagation. That's that's what I'm going to say. That seems... That would probably be my guess, but I don't know what a Hepburn map is. Mm, that's what mostly we're hearing over in the in the chat room there. And it is D, probability of tropospheric propagation. Have you ever seen a Hepburn map? Am I about to? Yep. Showing the probability of tropospheric ducting. dxinfocenter.com slash tropo.html. William Hepburn does these maps, and they're predicting where you might see uh, tropospheric ducting. And you can see it's graded there in colors as to how likely it is, and the black there is the least likely. And it's a colors increase you can see that it increases and if you go to those maps and you click through you can sort of see what he's predicting in the future as well so that might be a good resource there if you want to try to work some vhf and uhf uh, long-range communications uh, having those those ducks there and knowing when they're coming or possibly coming about could be useful information yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah, William R. Hepburn does those according to the name at the top. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't, I didn't know about those. I have to check those out a little closer later. I didn't either. And when I was putting the questions in, I had to go look and see. Tropospheric propagation of microwave signals often occurs in association with what phenomenon? Is it a gray line? B lightning discharges. C warm and cold fronts or d sprites and jets tropospheric propagation well it's not gray line lightning discharges are not very good for propagation not, not that i'm aware of they just cause problems it's got to be warm and cold fronts because I think it's t temperature inversion, I uh, believe, is uh, kind of part of it. So I'm thinking it's going to be C, warming cold fronts. And that's what everyone in the chat room is saying, and I'm going to agree with them. I believe it's where warming cold fronts join. There you go. Cool. As a matter I, of fact... I'm surprised. When I saw the list of topics tonight, I thought for sure there'd be some buzzer action, and there still may... Yeah. Um, and an interesting thing here, I did not know this was related, but you know, down here in the south, if if it gets cold enough and we got precipitation, we'll usually get snow, but there's also a good chance that it might be ice or freezing rain instead. Uh -huh. And I've often wondered, what makes a difference? If it's freezing... How come this time it comes around, it might be snow, and next time it might be freezing rain and sleet? And, and that's when it happens, is when we've got a cold front and a warm front coming together, and the cold front gets up under the warm front. The warm front is pushing in from the Gulf. It's overhead, and then it's colder down here on the ground, so it starts out as rain at the top, and then it falls through the 
cold atmosphere before it gets to the earth and so it hits here it's freezing rain instead of snow yeah and that and that's the best time to get on the radio except it's the worst time when you get ice build up on your antenna yep and i got some i got on every antenna this time around well i say every antenna the the fms didn't bother the am stations but the fms yeah it, it certainly did what might help to restore contact when DX signals become too weak to copy across an entire HF band a few hours after sunset? A. Switch to a higher frequency HF band. B. Switch to a lower frequency HF band. C. Wait 90 minutes or so for the signal degradation to pass. Or D. Wait 24 hours before attempting another communication on the band. 24 hours. That seems kind of extreme. Yeah. What that might be the answer. I don't know. What might help restore contact when DX signals become too weak to copy across an entire HF band a few hours after sunset? Well, if you've operated HF uh, much, then you should be able to reason this one out fairly mm -hmm. easy. During the day, HF propagation is going to be best up at the higher frequencies of the HF band. Uh, you know, uh, 20 meters is good chance it's good, 40. Uh, and, you know, if the muff is high enough, the band's above that. 80 meters, uh, not very good at all during the day, generally. And 160, mm -hmm. certainly not. But as uh, the sun starts going down and the atmosphere starts cooling off, the lower bands begin to come in and the higher bands go away. So, Well, not every night. I'm going to say the answer is switch to a lower frequency HF band, B. Yeah, that's what they're all saying over in the chat room. And it is. Yeah, if you've been on HF at all, you, most people probably realize that one. Yeah. And, you know, if you're studying for your extra, which is, you know, where these questions go, uh, you've been, possibly you've been a general for a while. So, you know, you probably already know this one. But if you're upgrading from technician straight to extra, well, you, you may not know that one. Atmospheric ducts capable of propagating microwave signals often form over what geographical feature? A. Mountain ranges. Oh. B. Forests. C. Bodies of water. D. Urban areas. Atmospheric ducts capable of propagation microwave signals form over what? It's not urban areas. It's not almost it's it's sea bodies of water. If you go back and look at that Hepburn map you showed earlier, they was all over the water and it was all most of it was black over land. Um so it's got to be bodies of water sea. Yeah. No Probably problem. shouldn't show the map until later. Probably shouldn't have. I didn't know that you'd go all Hepburn on me. <laughs> so yeah. Those, those maps are good. Well, I don't know if it's the right answer yet, but that's my answer, C. That's what everybody else is saying, and that's what I'm saying as well. Bodies of water, don't go away. We'll be right back. The great outdoors is calling. Get outside and under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate SDR transceivers. Stay connected while off the grid. The IC705 is a perfect transceiver for hams who want to enjoy both the great indoors and outdoors. It's the perfect QRP companion. This transceiver has features and functions at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, 70 centimeters, and the weight is just under 2 pounds. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall. 5 watts with BP272 battery, or 10 watts with 13.8 volts DC input. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the VHF-UHF weak signal world. 
This all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. 4.3-inch color touchscreen with real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display. Smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels. And it supports dual watch operation and full duplex operation in satellite mode. Visually sees the VHF UHF world with ICOM's IC9700. Heard it, worked it, logged it. ICOM's IC7300 is a high performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages to reduce the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. ICOM's IC7300 is a radio that changed the way entry-level HF is designed. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Why don't we give away something? Hey, I know what we can give away. I got a shirt and a hat over here. I'm not wearing it at the moment. So if I wanted to, to get one of those shirts or hats like that and and not pay anything for it but oh com you know, compliant take a chance you know on on winning one of those well you could take your chance by sending it's it's easy just send an email to ham college at amateurlogic.tv and all you need is a name you don't need a call sign or anything you just need a name and an email address and uh, if you want to put a note in there that's great we love hearing from you uh, but you don't have to even do that. And we have a winner. It is Bruce Baumgartner, N4ZJW. All right. Congrats, Bruce. Yeah. Congratulations. When a meteor strikes the Earth's atmosphere, a cylindrical region of free electrons is formed at what layer of the ionosphere? A, the E layer. B, the F1 layer. C, <laughs> the F2 layer. Or D, the D layer. When a meteor strikes the Earth's atmosphere, a cylindrical region of free electrons is formed at what layer of the ionosphere? I, and you know, this is one of those you just kind of probably got to know. But, yeah, and I don't. This looks like a pretty tough one. Well, I think I know. Um, I have a hunch. Oh, what's your hunch? Well, I, I, th I think it's going to be the E layer because I think that's the one that's primarily used when you've got uh, the skip off the atmosphere. Yeah. I just remember talk about, uh, you know, working meteor scatter propagation and the E-layer uh, being involved in that. Uh, but I honestly don't really know the answer for sure. If I were taking the test, I would probably choose E as my guess. Yeah. Well, they're all saying A in the chat room, but what they mean is E. Plus, yeah, E is the E-layer. There you go. It is the that's uh, that's something that's kind of fascinating to me. Um, the meteor scatter stuff. Yep. I don't know that much about it, but it's but it's pretty interesting concept. Which of the following frequency ranges is most suited for meteor scatter communications? Is it a 1.8 megahertz to 1.9 megahertz? B, 10 megahertz to 14 megahertz. C, 28 megahertz to 148 megahertz. Or D, 220 megahertz to 450 megahertz. Which of the following frequency ranges is most suited for meteor scatter? I don't think it's going to be a, I'd like down in the 160 meter range, 10 to 14. I don't know. I think it's going to be higher. I, I seem to remember something about people doing meteor scatter on two meters. So I think it's going to be C, 28 megahertz to 148 megahertz. 
Matter of fact, I know people done do meteor scatter on two meters, so I'm going with C. Mm, there's some mixed answers in the chat room there. I'm, I might be wrong, but I'm I'm sure I remember reading about people doing meteor scatter on two meters. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go with you on C because I remember hearing them do it on six meters too. So, uh, 28 megahertz, that's down around 10 meters. I uh -huh. know that it was possible there, but apparently so. That's the only answer that looks like it hits the bands that we're thinking. Yeah, and these, there's no good way to reason some of these out on this one. Just going to have to kind of study them and know, or or have, like, like a few of these, I remember reading about in the past when I was first getting licensed, reading about a lot of that stuff. But I've never tried any of this, but I do remember kind of reading over it in the past. When Okay, I got one for you. What type of atmospheric structure can create a path for microwave propagation? A, the jet streams. B, temperature inversion. C, wind shear. Or D, dust devil. Well, I have a dirt devil right here. But can you talk on it? No, and you know, it's not really that good on the atmosphere either. Well, I guess it's on the floor level layer it is. <laughs> uh, on the carpet layer? On the <laughs> Yeah, on the carpet layer. <laughs> <laughs> Which type of atmospheric structure can create a path for microwave propagation? Yeah, I think we've already covered this one this time. The jet it's just stream, not basically a reword of one of the previous ones. Temperature inversion, wind shear, or dust devil? Uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's B. Temperature inversion. We talked about that earlier. Um. The, another name for it is tropospheric ducting. Same phenomenon there. So, yep, yep. Everybody got that in the chat room as well. What is the typical range for tropospheric propagation of microwave signals? Is it a ten miles to fifty miles? Ooh. B, 100 miles to 300 miles. C, 1,200 miles. Or D, 2,500 miles. Okay. Typical range for tropospheric ducting of microwave signals. 10 to, f 10 to 50 miles, you don't necessarily have to have ducting for that. 100 to 300 miles. I know I know we used to have that a good bit when uh, we'd catch the Alabama repeater or some of those over in Louisiana. So that falls between the 100 and 300 miles range. For microwave? I'm, go I'm just going with this, man. Just roll with me for a minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, I've never tried to talk on my microwave. Uh, me neither. Um, C, 1,200. That seems kind of far, and 2,500 seems kind of far. I'm going with B, 100 miles to 300 miles, just because of what I said. Yeah. My logic may be totally wrong, but that's my guess, and there's prob maybe there'll be some buzzer action here. That's what most of them are saying over in the chat room. I'm going to agree with you. 100 to 300 miles. There you go. Got that one right. And yeah, uh, speaking of never talked on microwave or with your microwave before. Yeah, you know, when you open the door to stick your head in, it stops transmitting. So Yeah, it's true. That's the problem. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A very good thing. Okay. I got a question for you. Okay. What is the cause of auroral activity? A, the intersection of the F2 layer 
between the solar wind and the Van Allen belt. Ooh. Be an extreme low pressure area in the polar regions. C, the interaction in the E layer of charged particles from the sun with the Earth's magnetic field. D, meteor showers concentrated in the extreme northern or southern latitudes. What is the hmm. cause of auroral activity? Well, I don't think it's anything to do with meteor showers. I don't think it's anything to do with extreme low pressure areas. So, let's see. The interaction of the F2 layer between the solar wind and the Van Allen belt or the interaction of the E layer charged particles from the sun with the Earth's magnetic field. Well, I know the sun and the Earth's magnetic field are involved. I'm going to say it is C. Yeah, that's the only one that kind of makes any sense that's, to me. That's what they're all saying in the chat room. Let's see. That that could have been the buzzer question right there. Yeah. Well, it landed Maybe. on me, so yeah, it could have been. <laughs> Had to tighten up your Van Allen belt and hunker down and think about that one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of a, could be a tough one. Which of these emission modes is best for auroral propagation? Is it A, oh. C, W? B, single side band. C, F, M. Or D, R, T, T, Y. Ooh, this one I don't know. Best emission modes for auroral. I don't remember how much bandwidth RIDI takes up. I think it's... I'm going to guess A, because I think that's one that takes up the least amount of frequency range. Best mode for auroral propagation. It seems like that would be the best one for any pro kind of propagation to me. So yeah. I think it's I think it's A. That's what everybody's, again, I don't know. everybody's saying that I, in the chat room. Yeah, I wanted to look, but I didn't want to look until I had made my answer. Well, I'm going to agree with you. For, yeah, but for what reason? Is it the one I said because of the the bandwidth? Because that's the, what kind of, the only thing I could reason out about the ones that were on the screen there. Yeah, it's, um, it's the most efficient. You know, narrow bandwidth, so all your signals concentrated right there, so more efficient than the other modes. And since you're struggling to, uh, you know, to get a, a contact through that kind of propagation, that's reasons that CW probably be the the most likely to get through it. Well, it seems like that would be the most likely for pretty much any kind of propagation, though. Yeah. It's not the preferred one for a lot of things. In this case, though. What is meant by circularly polarized electromagnetic waves? A, waves with an electric field bent into a circular shape. B, waves with a rotating electrical field. C, waves that circle the Earth. Or D, waves produced by a loop antenna. Some interesting possibilities there. What is meant by circularly polarized electromagnetic waves? Uh, it's not a loop antenna. A loop antenna will produce either a horizontal or vertical, depending on how you got it mounted. Now, waves that circle the Earth. Nah. Um, hey, waves with an electric field bent in a circular shape. Um, 
No, I'm not sure that's even possible. B, waves with a rotating electrical field. I believe that's what it means. So that the transmitting and receiving stations don't necessarily need to have uh, both be vertical or both be horizontal. And, uh, you know, in case where maybe the propagation mode is, is changing some, you know, that polarization is getting shifted around, circularly polarized is going to work out the best anyway, which is the case, I think, with uh, a lot of uh, space type of transmissions. So I'm, I'm going to go with B, ways with the rotating electric field. That's what the chat room is saying. Yeah. I've actually got a circularly polarized antenna here, but I don't know if you can see it. It's pretty small, but, but my drones have circularly polarized antennas on them. The antenna looks like a clover leaf almost. It's kind of hard to see it yeah. from there. But, well, at any rate, if you could see it, you'd be really impressed. It's in My uh, FM broadcast antennas are circularly polarized. You know, when uh, FM broadcasting first came out, all the antennas were horizontally polarized because people listening to it were probably going to use their television antenna to receive the FM signal with. And it was always mounted horizontally polarized. Well, uh -huh. then when we started getting car FM receivers, that didn't work that great because they've got vertical antennas on cars. Mm -hmm. so that's when we started using uh, circular polarized antennas. Takes more power because you don't have as much gain in the vertical or horizontal planes when you're doing circular polarization. You're kind of splitting your power between them. In most cases, I don't. I've never seen one where you fed the vertical and horizontal separately. I think it's probably possible, but I've never seen it. Yeah. So. They it's this interesting. They use them on these because when they fly mm -hmm. all different directions, you don't want to have a dropout if you're trying to do some kind of a loop or something because mm -hmm. the polarization change. The one thing I wonder, I've often wondered, and I haven't really found anything about it, was if it matters if it's left hand or right handed polarized, um, because they they are been in different orientations from different different places that make them. I personally don't think it makes much difference, but I'm not sure if that really does or not. Yeah. That is our questions for tonight. We got that was through it? all those. No buzzer tonight. No buzzer. I thought for sure there'd be some buzzer action. When I saw the list of topics, I knew for sure it was. If you would have just we tried got... a little harder, we could have had some buzzer tonight. Hmm. Or maybe a little less harder. That last question had some potential. It did, yeah. And the one I had uh, earlier had some potential, but I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we come back in just a moment and uh, visit, see what's going on over in the chat room tonight. Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest-running video podcast, AmateurLogic.tv, with hosts George Thomas, Tommy Martin, and email dioding. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier and 
Oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about yeah. 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. Now yeah, we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and the heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite, actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. I particularly like that last one there. $29.99, you can get a 50-foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Do not get cord wet. Now, most of these J-poles are built with metal elements of tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. Yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. You know that antenna on there, the, uh, the tape measure beam? I actually had to fix that the other day. It got knocked off the shelf out of my building out there and uh, the hairpin match I put on there, solder joint broke off, so put it back. Well, I, I was talking with our friend uh, Rez on the repeater this week, uh, K1REZ. You know, we mentioned, yeah. I don't remember if it was the last time college or the last amateur logic. I think it was amateur logic about the uh, tea hunt they were going to have here. Yeah. Uh, they had it and had a winner and a lot of fun. Unfortunately, it was like during the ice storm, so participation <laughs> wasn't quite as heavy. Uh, it was actually the ice had started melting by the time that they had it. But, uh, I, you know, I, I think that probably had the participation down. And you know, everything was done remotely. He went out and hid the transmitter and, you know, told you the area where to go look. And, you know, uh, he actually talked to the guy who reported finding it. Um, but he didn't hear from anyone else. And I guess, yeah, if you, if you looked and you couldn't find it, would you report that? Maybe mm, not. You probably know. not. Yeah. So it was... Uh, that kind of makes sense. It sounded like a really fun event. We were talking about the antennas, and the guy who found it, or found it first anyway, was using a tape measure beam. Oh, yeah? Yep. He and his wife were using a tape measure beam. So that could have been you. Could have been. If, you so still, if I didn't get out too much when the ice was on the ground. Have you still got the rest of that tape measure? I do. It's still on eBay. Nobody's bought it yet. Imagine that, you know. Well, they're lost. I may need to make another antenna out of it sometime anyway, so that's okay. No, oh, let's see. Over in the chat room is Marty saying, oh, yeah, can't forget Dr. Zeno. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was telling Emil what he missed. Apparently, Emil was late for class. So yeah. I'll, I'll see you after class, Emil. Yeah. Um, we'd have to talk about that. I'll give you your work, your assignments. See, that's the kind of things that you would only see live, Emil, because we cut out generally all of those uh, old uh, commercials and things like that that are in there uh -huh. during the live event. You, they're not usually in the recorded version. So yeah, and those And those are great, too. I like them. I like. Yep. I may have to snip that out and send it to him, let him <laughs> see what happened there. I don't see anybody uh, much talking about tonight's class, and I can understand why. Um, you know, that's kind of stuff that after you've been through it, you just might not want to talk about it for a while. Yeah, well, there were some tough topics in there. They're not things that... Uh that most people deal with very often, uh, for the most part. Some of it's a little bit more than others, but 
But I don't know anybody that really does uh, EME or Meteor Scatter stuff, like, is really set up to do that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, was that one of the high-performance racing drones? This this little drone right here will go about 80, I think about 80 miles an hour. It, it goes so fast, I can't fly it. it. It's like when you hit the throttle on it, it's gone, li literally. Man. And I, I can't fly it. Oh, I wanted to. It looks like it was going to be fun. Oh, Marty says we needed a picture of K-9 EID's two-meter array that he had in Illinois. Yeah, I've seen that before. I don't think he could aim that at the moon, Marty. That was the only trouble there. But if he could, he probably would not need that legal limit amplifier. Have you ever seen that one, Tommy? Uh -uh. Bob's uh, two-meter antenna array he built. No. Oh, it was it was crazy. He just had a lot of stacked beams on there. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But he did it. Now, I don't know that I would want to be in the house up under it because it was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of metal up there, man. Yeah, no kidding. That's that is huge. I'm gonna go back and look at that again after we get finished. Look a little closer. Yeah, Marty was asking, did we lose our power during the ice storm? No, fortunately, we didn't. A lot of people around did. Yeah, but, uh, I didn't lose any. Uh, actually, I lost it at one of the transmitter sites. Not during the first of the ice storm, but uh, the last couple of days, I, d I did lose power at one of them. The generator came on, and it ran for like two and a half days till it ran out of fuel, and it oh. shut down. And that was like on a Saturday or Sunday, so I had a backup site I could switch to to you know keep something on the air, but... Uh, you know, because I couldn't get any fuel out there with the way the roads were and where this site was. There would have been no getting a truck up that uh, icy, muddy hill. Yeah. Did it so, run off of diesel? Uh, it runs off propane. Propane? Yeah. A lot of them run off diesel, but every one I've got, I, I didn't put them in. They were there when I got there. They run off propane with the exception of one, and it's identical generator, but it runs off natural gas, the one at the studio, which is pretty nice because, you know, it's in town and you got natural gas right there, so you don't have to worry about keeping the tank full. Mm -hmm. But the bad thing yeah, about... Gas never goes off yeah, hardly. The propane or natural gas generators is you have to derate them. If you're running them on that fuel... Uh, you can't get as much power out of the engine as if you were running it off, uh, say, diesel or gasoline. Oh, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. I had uh, I had plenty of gas for my generator, and if we would have lost it, lost power, I can run my central heat off of it. We've got gas heat, gas hot water. Mm -hmm. um, we do have electric stove, but I also have a propane stove and plenty of propane for it. So we would have been okay. Yeah. We we should have been. I um, tested my, my little Coleman generator, 5 kilowatts, and it cranked. And I filled up the 5-gallon tank, and I went and bought another 5 gallons of um, non-ethanol gas because that's the only thing I run in it. Mm -hmm. And so the generator was running. At least it was running when I tested it. And I've got the same situation, um, uh, natural gas furnace. Of course, you got to have electricity to, to run that, but, you know, I could have got enough out of the generator to do that. So, uh, just to spare yeah. my Well, it was cold enough. I would have run the cord up for that, if, even if I'd had to do without something else. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I got plenty of batteries and things and DC lights and everything else, so we would have been just fine. Yeah. Had all my batteries charged up. I did too. Had my whole my wall of the handy talkies here charged up. Yeah, if I had just a few more of those twelve volt lead acid cells, I could make one hundred and twenty volts. Not AC, but 
<laughs> I've got quite a collection of them now, and I, I charged them all up, too. Didn't have to use them. But better to be prepared. If my generator would not have worked, uh, we would have definitely lost electricity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Luckily, we made it by okay. Uh, Mike says his uh, generator he installed out of the data center had a Ford V10 that runs on natural gas. Wow, that must have been a big generator. Yeah, I think ours is a V8. It's most of the ones I've got are 100 kWs. And I got a couple of, I think the couple of 50s, 50 or 60. But you can't get that out of them because, you know, the fuel that we're running on. I should have had a V8. But all I have is a little five horsepower lawnmower motor on mine. Yeah. Mine's got a little more than that. Not sure how many. Actually, horsepower. I don't know what it's got. I think it might be a six and a half. Yeah, it's more than a five, I'm sure. We appreciate everyone being with us tonight and getting through these questions. I don't know what we're covering in the next episode. We don't think that far ahead. We're going to have to do them anyway. <laughs> you know, if you're taking your exam, you don't know what you're going to get. So um, we will tackle those next time around. Yep. Well, any final words for tonight before we go, Dean? Now, uh, for those of you uh, that don't know about the net, we've been having the Amateur Logic Soundcheck net every Tuesday night, 8 Central or 200 UTC, which will soon be 100 UTC when time rolls back. Um, but anyway, it's a lot of fun. We usually have a question to keep it interesting. Uh, this last week's question was really good. The net ran a little over three hours, like three hours and ten minutes, which is a pretty long net, but it's it was a lot of fun. Um, it's well connected. As you can see, we've got a lot of different ways to get on there. Um, so anyway, if you haven't checked in, to make a set yourself a reminder and come join us on the net each Tuesday night. Always a lot of fun, and like you said, actually this this coming week, uh, Marty uh, AD Zero PO and Tom W A Two IVD will be the uh, net controls. I believe it's their turn up. So we have uh, eight of us that rotate weeks to do the net control job, and uh, anyway, keeps it interesting. And they're both over in the chat room right now. Oh yeah. So. So it should be a really great net. They, yep. they do a good job. Everybody does a good job. You can join us throughout the month on one of our social media groups, facebook.com slash group slash ham college. You can follow us at ham college on Twitter. Uh, you can check us out on mewe.com slash join slash ham college or groups.io slash g slash amateur logic. If you'd just like to get a notification of when a new episode has been posted, or when the next live stream will be. So we're looking forward to seeing some of y'all throughout the month there and uh, visiting with us there. And we'll see you on, should be the 12th of March for the next Amateur Logic episode and at the end of March for the next time college. Any final thoughts, Dean? No, but, uh, we'll see you at the next uh, Amateur Logic and be safe in 73. All right. 73. What characterizes libation fading of an EME signal? A, slow change in the pitch of the CW signal. It's, it's libration, not libation. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let me read it again. Then. Well, uh, stroke. Maybe I should put these back on. <laughs> yeah, spoken like uh, Dean Martin.
We've got an interesting topic lined up tonight. Why don't you tell us, though, what we talked about last time around? Well, it just so happens, I know, because I have it on a piece of paper. We did uh, operating methods, contests, and DX operating, remote operation techniques, Cabrillo format, QS selling, and RF network connected systems. Were we at the same show? Same class? Probably, probably not, because I printed the wrong sheet. What characterizes libration fading of an EME signal? A, slow change in the pitch of the signal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what characterizes libration fading of an EME signal? <laughs> You gotta get it out. <laughs> yeah, I know. What characterizes libration fading of an EME signal? A slow change. <laughs>